campaign to try and rectify some of the concerns and issues that we've, our members have found over the years with the practicality of depositing archives. So uh, where are we? We got that there. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, there's no nice pictures in this. There are just lots of lines of text. Um, basically, where did it all start from? Obviously, people created archives when they were excavating, whether they're antiquarians or, or archaeologists. But during the sort of 70s and 80s, there was a growing concern about the fact that publications weren't coming out. That was the principal concern, um, which led to the Freer Report and later on the Cunliffe Report. And the Freer Report was the first one that I know of, or maybe corrected, that, that really specified a, f a stage in the process which was archiving and what that archive might consist of. And it talked about different parts of the archive um, so that archaeologists could plan for that. It didn't talk about how it was going to get deposited, and in those days it was just assumed that archives could quite easily be put into a museum and they would be curated. And so then in the 1990s, you started getting a whole raft of different bits of guidance coming in. There's guidance produced, first of all, by Jill Andrews and, and um, Engl uh, English Heritage on managing of archaeological projects. Uh, first of all, Map 1 in 1989, but closely followed by a much larger uh, voluminous document called Map 2, um, and this went into obviously a lot of detail, but included that iterative process of evaluating the value, the, the potential research value or the significance of what was found and then deciding what to do with it next. And those are key issues, that proportionality are still key issues about what we need to keep in an archive and what needs to be deposited. And then of course there were uh, guidance on uh, how the archive ought to be, um, ought to be stored and uh, packaged and labelled. And there was then guidance from the Society of Museum Archaeologists about retention and selection of materials. And finally, after the 1990s, and the, a revamp was done in a much larger or more integrated volume by Duncan, 2007, and slightly revised in 2011. So, lots of guidance, should be no problem at all with dealing with an archive and depositing it. Uh, however, you have at the top there, PVG 16. And of course, with PVG 16, there was an exponential growth in work going on and the amount of material that was being gathered, both physical material archive and documentary archive. And we're not necessarily talking about digital archiving in this session, well, well I'm certainly not. So, in the following period, you then got a more of an identification of the problems that were uh, uh, growing. And FAME members were seeing this uh, uh, in about 2008, 2009. We were talking about this. We launched a conference with the Society of Museum Archaeologists in 2011, which talked about trouble in store. And we undertook a survey. And the survey says, as if I look at this piece of paper here, tell me what it is. Um, 20, 2010, we published in The Archaeologist that there were 42,500 boxes of finds and 10,000 document files from 6,729 individual projects which needed to be deposited, which couldn't be deposited. And following on from that, the survey that was, we did as part of Rachel Edwards' Um, evaluating the archaeological resource in store, informing the future, which was published in 2012, identified 9,000 homeless archives, 40 museums and 28 local authority areas without provision for collecting archives. Well, that's the problem. It's not our members necessarily not wanting to deposit archives or not having enough money to do that or seeing it as something at the end of the chain that's just not important. It's actually being able to do what we would naturally do as archaeologists, which is to index and catalogue and, and uh, curate these records. And part of that problem, or the major part of that problem, is ownership. 
and it's discovering who owns the artefacts, it's the objects. That's the big, big problem. So in 2014, Helen Parslow at Archaeological Archives Forum, um, somewhat um, put up to it by other members of fame, asked the question, can we not get transfer of title as part of phased planning conditions? So it makes it very clear to the applicant, to the developer, that they have to identify who the owner is and they have to agree that they will be deposited or that they will maintain those artifacts themselves. Um, we followed that up with an archive statement in 2012, uh, 2016, sorry. Uh, and the sort of headlines I've got up on the board there. But I'm just going to read out a little bit of it because I just think it's, it's important to reiterate it. So our statement on archives said that the value of archaeological archives, Fame believes that archaeological archives provide a sustainable legacy consisting of the primary record from archaeological investigation and archaeological archives are of considerable public benefit as an educational resource and as a means to help in understanding our cultural heritage. Now, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. But then, the responsib responsibility and legal obligations for archaeological archives, the majority of them are commissioned through the planning process. That the requirements through that planning process need to be made explicit and enforced by the planning authority on the applicant. There is a fundamental flaw in the planning process as there is no legal requirement for museums or other repositories to accept archaeological archives. And it is therefore the responsibility of the planning authority's archaeological advisor to ensure that what is included within their brief is reasonable and deliverable by the applicant. So why put into a brief you've got to deposit an archive if you know in your area, your museum does not collect archives. It's impossible to complete. It's impossible to legally discharge that condition. So there are obviously there are ethical and professional duties that we all have. <coughs> and we also said that archaeological archives can no longer be stored by the organizations that have excavated them once studies have been completed because they are not the legal owners and do not have facilities for long-term curation and display. And that was another thing. There was just this sort of feeling, well, you know, fame members and, and, and other archaeological organizations can store them in, perpetu in perpetuity. There's been a lot of education, I think, of people who are not directly involved in this to get over those simple concepts of it's all to do with property and the legality of what we hold and transfer. It's not a question of using a stick to beat us with because we're not depositing the archives. So our final point was to ensure public benefit is achieved as intended within planning policy, national agencies and government departments responsible for heritage within the constituent uh, countries of the UK need to resolve the current situation and then to ensure for the future a specific requirement for museums and appropriate repositories to take these archives for an appropriate fee from the applicants. Now, obviously, somewhere like Scotland's got a, a very different system. So it is much more a problem that we face in England and Wales. And Wales does have the National Museum, which will, as a last resort, take archives, collections. Oops, what have we done now? Uh, so, um, since that statement was issued, um, we have been moving forward. Thanks very much to Historic England, jointly uh, who, who um, pulled together a, or invited a group of uh, different organizations to be part of a panel to discuss the future of archaeological archives, to try and tease through these problems. And it was also highlighted as part of the CIFA um, workshops on 21st century archaeology. And that has been making progress. It's, it had advice from, um, from a barrister as to how to put together a deed uh, so that the landowner can transfer this, uh, their legal ownership. And 
also to produce guidance to help with that. Um, what we, however, still have concerns about, I think, are the questions that we've got up here, which is how these, um, how this idea that we try and engage the applicant at a very early stage in the planning process, making it clear that they have an obligation to identify who the owner is and get that deed uh, um, agreed, has to come down to the involvement of the archaeological advisors. And archaeological advisors are often not part of CIFA, and they may not even be part of Algeo. But one of the things we want to make sure is that they are involved and they will, uh, they will be enforcing this. They will be engaging with applicants and making it sure that they are clear that it is their responsibility to do this, which takes the onus off us all having to try and chase around and find, find that kind of ownership. And there's an example that I've tried to give lots of times before is, you know, obviously you could have a site which could be for Bellway Homes or whatever it is, and they've got 13 different landowners on that site. Now, you don't know that. You've been engaged by somebody who's maybe two, three stages down from Bellway as a client. And you don't have uh, an inroad to find out who owns that bit of pottery from that field there as opposed to who owns this bit here. And similarly, if you're dealing with somebody like, at land, you know, like um, Jaguar Land Rover, which is I've had this situation, no one in Jaguar Land Rover, who, who is it who has that permission to legally transfer it, to, and nobody's going to see that as a priority because you're just talking about archaeology, you're just talking about bits of pottery. So it's a very difficult, it's a bit of a conundrum really, it's a bit of a difficult, difficult situation. Um, but we also have on the other side the museums. How can we make sure the museums are going to be prepared to take our material? So we need buy in from that. And um, we've obviously been discussing with the Society of Museum Archaeologists who are only a small collection of individuals within a much larger body of museums. Now, on the panel, as Duncan will say in a minute, we have Arts Council England, and Arts Council England are the people who fund the museums. And so by bringing them in, and if it then comes down from them that museums have to do this, we hope we'll get progress on this. Basically, it's up to local planning authorities to enforce this, and they don't enforce archiving. So we need to link these different aspects together. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to hand over to Duncan, who I'm sure is going to have good answers to those questions. <laughs> and there's some people I know who are going to ask him some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, can't get this bloody thing on. <laughs> it's your trick. Um, right, so I talked about the deed of transfer and transfer of title last year. It was so good, you invited me back this year. Um, but if you missed it last year, bad luck, because I don't want to go into that in too much detail. Um, I've got some slides. It's um, the, the, the future, the um, Archaeological Advisory Panel that Historic England formulated in response to the Mendoza Review of Museums in England um, is now transmogrified into the Future for Archaeological Archives programme. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly a bit about that and how that programme is hoping to answer some of Tim's questions and to resolve some of our problems. And Tim's absolutely right. This is a collective issue that requires a collective response. Um, unfortunately, I can't see anything, but hopefully, yes, so that, <coughs> that is uh, an extract from the action plan for the Future for Archaeological Archives program. Um, and it should tell you the the parts of the plan that um, we've divided into work packages and these are related to the main points that came out of uh, the Mendoza review 
which led to an agreement with DCMS between Historic England and DCMS about how we, what, what areas we were going to focus on uh, to resolve the issues that Mendoza highlighted around archaeology collections in museums. So we've got establishing the basis for action, proving outside of the archaeological community that there is a problem that needs resolving. Establishing the best option for future archiving provision. In other words, how do we ensure that there is somewhere to put everything? <coughs> developing the basis for best practice across the sector between all our different groups and um, innovation in archaeological archiving. Are there, are, some people are very keen on digital substitutes for actual things. I'm not, as a pottery specialist, <laughs> uh, is, I'm not going anywhere near that. But um, you know, are there things that we can do in our practice that will improve the, the ways in which we collect and deposit archaeological material. Um, and then reviewing the situation, making sure that we are keeping up to speed. So this is where um, the main body of our work is, in establishing the best option and in developing the basis for action. Um, the uh, model deed of transfer and advice from the QC on the legal basis of ownership have been done. The next stage with that, in answer to Tim's question, is I spoke last week to the Algeo AGM, and I'm going to form a working party with members of Al, not, yeah, Algeo um, and bring in planning officers and hopefully some representatives of, uh, of the, the land owning community, if there is such a thing, um, to try and work out how best to introduce the deed of transfer as, a, as, a, as something that can be resolved and is just becomes part of the process. We, 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 don't, we need it to be with people who are outside of the archaeological process so that planning officers understand that this is important and how to make it work. So that's, that's what we're going to do with the deed of transfer. Um, but... In the short term, I suppose in the medium term really, over the next five years, um, we, are, uh, we, we have uh, a, the Arts Council and Historic England recently um, received the completed report of an options appraisal on, um, on archaeological storage, a sustainable future for archaeological archives and options appraisal, um, which essentially set out a number of models for resolving the, the space problem, where to put stuff. Um, and we've selected one of those options, which is to create a single national store for, um, for archaeological archives that have nowhere else to go initially. Museums that are still collecting will continue to collect if they want to, but there are museums as Tim says, that do not collect uh, and will not become owners of, of that material. They will not receive that into, those, into their collections unless they, uh, unless they join up with, with, the, with the overall initiative. Um, so we're hoping to develop this at the Science Museum's um, storage centre in uh, Roughton near Swindon, which is a, a, a former airfield, um, they have built the biggest building I've ever seen. <laughs> um, this, is, this, this area here is just the area, the, the, the area where stuff gets unloaded. It's big enough to drive two articulated lorries into through the loading bay. Um, and it goes on forever. And we want to build one of those, essentially. Um, we'll need quite a lot of money to do that. Um, so the next stage, well, um, my curator for uh, archaeological archives at Historic England is just buying a Euro Millions lottery ticket every week <laughs> until she wins enough to, um, to help us build a store. That's her plan. Um, it, it, it can't fail. It can't fail. It, it hasn't worked yet, I must say. Um, no, so what we're doing is putting together a business case to take the DCMS 
uh, who are actually quite keen. The Science Museum are very keen to be partners with Historic England on this. Um, and we just need the right opportunity, the, the, the right moment to introduce uh, our begging letter to the government, <laughs> effectively. Um, but we are putting together a business case which we will take forward to try and get the funding behind uh, the cost of this building. But that is the short-term solution. We hope to be that to be up and running within five to seven years if we get the funding at the right time. Um, it's not going to be the final solution because um, every, every space gets filled eventually, but um, it, will, it will at least give people somewhere to put their stuff. But more importantly, behind the, the, that solution of, a, of, a, of a, a, simply a, a massive shed is the concept of the National Collection for Archaeological Archives. What we'd like to see is museums signing up to become part of that national collection. That doesn't mean that they have to transfer their collections to a national store. What it means is that they, just, that, that they sign up to a common set of standards for archive delivery, a common set of standards for archive curation and, and accessibility, a common set of standards for ensuring that digital material is adequately deposited and curated, um, and, uh, and accepting use of, for instance, the deed of transfer in terms of settling issues of ownership. So there'll be a common set of practice for archaeological archive delivery, simplifying all the problems that you have invariably countered, uh, encountered as you've tried to deposit at different museums in different parts of the country. So that concept will bring together every, every archaeological collection, ultimately. I mean, it'll be voluntary. You won't have to, to, museums won't have to sign up to it, but the idea is that more and more we'll see the benefits of doing so. And those museums that can no longer collect physically their collections, which will still be theirs, will be able to go to the massive store in Wiltshire. Um, I sent these slides to Tim a few weeks ago and I've forgotten what they are now. Um, so here's some... So those are your questions, aren't they, they Tim? Are. Yes, so I've just put them up again uh, to, uh, to remind you of what to ask me next. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>